For all you guys that like turntables, I have another one. This is a good one. This is a Thorns TD-165. I just happened to have had this one given to me, so this is now my turntable, number two for me. And uh, this one needs a little bit of work. Let's uh, get working on it and make it sound great. Hey guys, look what I just acquired. A relatively nice condition. I mean, the top has seen better days, but uh, this should polish out, I would think, quite nicely with some polish. But uh, it's a Thorns TD-165. Um, I think it's missing a belt. Anyway, we're going to do a service on this unit. And uh, the, the, the cartridge itself is in pretty sad shape. If we look at that needle, it's, um, well, take a look at the, the needle that's on this thing. This is, yeah. That's going to do a good job on the records. I've got a, a new Sure cartridge. I don't have the stylus in it right now because I don't want to damage it, but I got a new a new uh, Sure cartridge here that I'm going to mount on it. And I just went down to the expensive place to buy a new belt for a TD-165 and paid $28 for the belt from the expensive place. But uh, these ones do use a special belt, so we'll put a new belt on this thing. And um, see how this thing sounds. So to do that, we can just, actually, you don't even need to remove the rubber mat, although you can if you want. But uh, the rubber mat doesn't have to come off. You can just lift the turntable platter off. It's nice heavy. I guess it's probably about a, I'm going to say about a three kilogram turntable. Uh, the platter, I mean, the outer rim. Here's the actual sub platter. And there is a belt on here, but I guess this belt is no good. It falls off. It's stretched. Um, we're going to we're going to lubricate the bearing on here. So I'm just going to pull the main bearing apart, and uh, we're going to put some oil down into the the bearing here and uh, lubricate it. So I'll just put a drop or so of three in one oil down into the bearing. Maybe put a little bit more onto the onto the shaft here and we'll just drop this in and let it let it spin down. This is a very uh, tight bearing so the oil is going to actually hold some air in there and it's going to bounce around a bit but eventually it will drop into place. There we go. Spinning nice and freely. We're going to get the new belt and place the new belt around the pulley and around the actual sub platter. And then I'm just going to test it and make sure that it's, uh, whoops, not into the little hook here. I'm going to test this and make sure that it's going to track properly for 33 and 45. And then we'll mount that cartridge and give this thing a test. We'll see how good it sounds. So, first, let me get the power, power cord. It's amazing what some people will do with old equipment, right? This one was given to me. This is now my turntable. Let's uh, see how this thing works. So 33, there's 33, and there's 45. So here it's running at 45. And to change it down to 33, it just drops down to the other pulley, just like that. 45, 33. We'll put the sub platter on it. We'll check it for speed. So there's the platter back on. What's nice about these is the 45 RPM adapter. There's your 45 RPM adapter on and then you just turn it around and push it down the other way and it drops down into the actual base so you can play your LP records and when you want to play a 45 you just grab this and turn it over. It does come out of there. <laughs> 45 and then you just turn it around 
for 33. It's just not the easiest thing to grab, but there you go. Just sticking there a bit with the rubber mat for 45 and then 33. So turn the, turn the unit on, let me grab my strobe disc. We'll take a look at this under a magnetic fluorescent. We'll start it up. It's funny how these turntables take a few seconds to get up to speed. And, oh, don't oh, hit the power button off on my, uh, <laughs> on my power bar when I plugged in the light and I did it again. Okay, our 33 RPM is this wide band right here that is not moving, it's stationary. That's our 33 RPM. For 45, we turn this over and switch it up to 45. And it will eventually get up to speed as the belt jumps into place. And then we have our 45, which is this middle band here for 45 RPM and it's stationary. So speed is exactly correct. So first we'll remove the old cartridge from the head shell. I always remove the needle whenever I'm gonna work on anything like this just so that it doesn't get damaged. We'll take out the screws that hold the cartridge in place. couple of little spacers that go on this or were on there. I don't know if they're needed for the, the new cartridge or not, but they were on there with this one. Unplug it. We'll just get the new cartridge and sit it in here and see how it fits. These spacers may or may not be needed with these screws because this is a deeper cartridge than the other one. spacers it doesn't look like they're going to be required on this particular cartridge I don't know who did this <laughs> but here's the the two screws yep they go all the way down so they they should actually probably just screw right into the base without having to have anything additional on there as far as to space it out it looks like these will go right into the base no problem Excellent. No, I haven't done any angle adjustments or anything on here. I just used the original screw holes, which should which should have this in here fairly close to being correct. Although I'm sure there's going to be room for adjustment certainly going to be better than what was on here when I got it, that's for sure.
Okay, new cartridge is mounted. Let's get the needle on. We'll put it in the turntable. I'll do a balance on it. So here's my new my new cartridge, my new needle here for this thing. Okay, that's got that in place. First we'll do is the the uh, the balance on this. I'm going to set the weight to zero back here and we'll see how close it is to being uh, zero. It looks like it's trying to, looks like it's not hanging level. So we're just going to zero okay, That's a little too high Ideally I just want this thing to, to hover We'll just remove the anti-skate while I do this We'll just lift that little weight out of the way That's pretty close. So I'm just going to hold the weight and turn this to zero. And then I can increase my weight to two grams, which is approximately what this requires. And I believe this is set for two. The anti skating is adjusted on here just by moving the loop of this little bit of fishing line from one piece to the next and then the weight hangs over and that's the anti-skate settings now it's going to grab a record and uh, we'll play a record here what have I got to play got some Jan, Jan Ackerman from Focus we'll put him on and listen to what he has to what he has to play. Can't play this for you guys, obviously, for more than a few seconds anyway. But it'll be interesting to see how this sounds. Come on, get up to speed. These things take forever to get up to speed. It's almost a crime that I didn't clean that record, isn't it? into playing nostalgia gotta like how long this thing takes to get up to speed because the motors in these things aren't very strong right um, it's a synchronous motor and they don't have a lot of torque they use on they they rely on the inertia of the actual weight of the the platter and as you can see the tone arm is in no hurry to go down either 
This is very good dampening. Fantastic! Let's see, I got my old got my old classic records here that I bought at the dollar not the dollar store, the second hand store. I only paid a dollar for them. Okay, not the dollar store, the second hand store. But I bought these for a for a buck. I, I was just down there and I just was going through some of their stuff and I found some some really good old stuff here. So let's just play a bit more here. I can't play this for more than a few seconds, but I'll play a few more seconds of this and we'll we'll listen to a few of the other records that I got as well. Watch how long it takes to slow down. The problem with these turntables is they're almost impossible to queue up. <laughs> like I want to get right on the groove here and I gotta kinda try to find it. Return to Forever record, man. You know, one of the best shows I ever saw performed, and this is going back, oh, I guess probably close to 10 years now, Return to Forever, when they reformed after 30 years, they played at, uh, I think it was GM Place, it was called GM Place at the time, in Vancouver, and I, I actually took the show in, and it was, this was probably the best show I've ever seen in my life, and to see them play, like, it was about 20 minutes long for, for I think they did a song to the Pharaoh Kings, that's what it just played there, they played it for about 20 minutes, it was just unbelievable, just to watch uh, Chick Corea, Stanley Clark, Al Di Miola, and Lenny White on stage, they were larger than life, and it was like they had never left, it was like they'd been playing all along for 30 years, it was just fantastic. <laughs> Some of the stuff that got me hooked in, hooked on jazz and fusion back in the 70s was Return to Forever. Got all their old stuff, old Chick Corea electric, Chick Corea electric band. It's just fantastic stuff. And I found this record. I didn't have this one. Like, I have all this on CD. I, you know, I bought all this stuff on CD um, in the 80s. But I didn't have a vinyl. And I just, I was flipping through at the second hand store. I was flipping through the records. And I came across this one, and that was I think this was two bucks, and I, I had to have it. And it's actually in very good condition, cons considering a lot of records that you find, you know, in the used places are, are are not in really good shape. But look at that; it's just this one was really well looked after. No scratches. It's almost it's 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 you know. A little bit of a scuff here. That's just, I think, from pulling it in and out of the, the sleeve. But it's actually in, you know, considering the age of this record, it's actually in really good condition for a vinyl. I love the turntable. Look at this. This is a, 
this is like a AR design. I think AR Acoustic Research did the same thing. It's a it's a spring balanced turntable. So the the tone arm and the the actual platter bearing are isolated, and you know they're mounted on a, a shock. Of, well, not so much a shock absorber, just a spring, because uh, if it was a shock absorber. It wouldn't bounce like that, but uh, that's to, to try and isolate the tone arm and the platter from external vibrations from you know your speakers, for example. It's to give some type of isolation because the ones that are rigid, of course, any vibration coming in will get to, will get transferred right into the sound. And if we lower the needle down without the turntable running. You know, you shouldn't hear. I guess you will still hear a bit of resonance, but, but uh, you'll still hear some resonance trans transmitted through those springs. But the idea behind it was it was to to try and isolate the record from or the turntable and the the, the record and the tone arm from external vibrations. Although, you know. crank the volume up all the way. I'll get a bit of feedback if I crank it up. I had the volume all the way. I got the volume about three quarters of the way now. <clears throat> As I start this thing up, you'll probably hear the motor groaning away there when it first starts to turn. Yeah, that's not good. As it gets up to speed, it is going to grumble and complain. There can be a lot of excessive. That's why you don't drop the needle on these until. It's pretty quiet. It's pretty quiet. Right? It's just groove noise. Oh, you hear the pre-echo there? You'll hear the pre-echo. Listen. There's the music playing. One revolution before the music, you're actually hearing the pre-echo caused by the adjacent groove. Either that or it was pre-echo from print-through on the master tape, which it could have been that too. It could have been pre-echo from print-through on the master tape because, of course, that's a an issue with I'm just looking to see if it's exactly one turn I think it's I think it's pre echo from the record listen again here yeah it's pre echo on the record because it's exactly one one rotation before the music starts you'll hear that pre echo and what caused that is that's just influence from the adjacent, the groove that's one adjacent revolution in. Because if it was off the master tape, it, it'd still be a pre-echo, but it wouldn't be exactly one revolution. So that's one of the, um, that's one of the pitfalls of vinyl. I know that there's, there's people out there that just are in love with their vinyl and they think that vinyl has the best sound and that there's nothing as good as vinyl. I disagree with that theory vinyl has its sound and for playing old recordings that were done were mixed for vinyl then it can have a warmer sound than the digital copies that were made from the master tape that was equalized for vinyl If you have a good recording that was remixed from the session tapes and it was remixed for the digital domain, you can hear the music coming off the needle itself on these things. You can hear it because it's uh, pretty loud what they're playing there recorded to maximum groove depth it sounds like you can you can hear the needle 
Um, <clears throat> anyway, a, a mix that was done for digital will surpass anything that they could ever put onto vinyl. And I don't care wh whose opinion is what, um, that's just the fact that vinyl is limited by what they could cut into the groove. And to make the format work, you had to uh, center your bass. So your bass guitar, kick drums, etc., had to be center panned. They couldn't be extreme left or extreme right because it would cause tracking problems. It would basically blow the needle right out of the groove and cause all kinds of distortion. They also had to DS high frequencies, the S, -S, -S, -S sounds. They had to DS it, and in some cases they actually had to get the artist to change the lyrics and re-record it so that they didn't have a S in their, in their vocals because uh, that had a tendency to cause also nasty distortion that was inherent to the vinyl disc format that doesn't happen in digital. I know the vinyl, the, the vinyl enthusiasts will talk about quantizing and how you're chopping up the sound into, into numeric values, and that is true, but it's also being done at a minimum of two times the highest frequency that can be recorded. So on a CD, the highest frequency that can be recorded is 20 kilohertz, and it's being sampled at 44,100 times per second. So you have a minimum of two samples for every frequency at the highest frequency that can be recorded. And at the lower frequencies, below 20 kilohertz, you've got multiple samples, thousands of samples uh, occurring during that waveform. So once that waveform is, is uh, reproduced and the stair step, as they call it, is removed, you end up with a signal that is identical to what has gone in. And CD is not the highest resolution. There were other higher resolution digital formats. Uh, DAT, for example, used 48 kilohertz sampling and 96 kilohertz sampling was also used on a lot of the uh, commercial um, professional recording equipment. So uh, yeah, vinyl, it's okay, but um, I still like the sound of digital better. But for playing old records like this, you'll typically get a better sound from a vinyl record when the master tape was mastered for distribution on vinyl because they've equalized it for vinyl. So that's where people will say, well, I've got a CD of the same recording, the same release, and the vinyl sounds better than the CD. And in some cases it does, because in the early days of CDs, engineers did not pay attention to the equalization curve that they had to put on for the vinyl record. They just took that tape that was EQ'd for vinyl and digitized it and released a CD and it sounded like crap. And that's why CD got a bad reputation in the early days because the record companies are cheap. They always have been cheap. They won't spend the money to, they wouldn't spend the money to uh, fix that problem. They would make one mix and that went for both CD and vinyl. Once vinyl disappeared and everything was going digital, the sound quality improved greatly for CDs. But of course, by that point, everybody had moved to MP3 and we're listening to crap anyway, right? But uh, anyway, that's uh, that's my rant on turntables. I know I'm gonna get lots of debates on this because this debate has been going on forever and forever it will be going, it'll continue. Someone's gonna sound off and, and give me their opinion as why they think that vinyl sounds better. And I've read all this, I've read them all, believe me, I've read everybody's comment about vinyl and why they think it's a better format than the digital formats. And not one of their theories holds any water when you look at the, the, the science behind it. Uh, a digital recording is superior. That's it. No, it's end of discussion. You can talk about a continuous wave and a continuous groove and, and you can, you know, you can 
sugarcoat it any way you want, but an analog recording is never going to uh, match a digital recording. It just it can't do it. You're talking a physical stylus that has to trace through a groove, and it's not very accurate. It's it was good enough for what we had at the time, but you move on. Technology improves and things get better. And a hundred years ago, this was great. That's all we had, but uh, we've got a lot better now. So that's all I'm going to say about vinyl. You won't see me going out buying new vinyl records, but I still like to listen to the ones that I have. And when I go through the secondhand store or to garage sales and stuff, and I find some rare gems on vinyl, you bet I'm buying them. Anyway, that's enough for me on this. This thing is fixed. I'm going to take this in the house, and I'm going to hook it up, and I'm going to hook this up to my tube amp in my living room, so when I want to put on a vinyl and just listen to it, I'm going to use this turntable. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you again in the next one real soon.